on our our DevOps uh, YouTube channel. Uh, just a few announcements. So uh, we are planning our DevOps days in Salt Lake. So if you are going to be in Salt Lake, it'll be March 13th to the 14th. That is a Wednesday and Thursday. Um, Hello. And tickets should go on sale in about a week. Um, and our website is just getting updated. So I'm, I'm working on that. So hopefully next week we'll start selling tickets. We have our speakers. We'll, we'll post those soon. We still are looking for a couple of workshops if anyone's uh, like a webinar. would like to do. And uh, yeah. And then also, like we mentioned, we do this every month about for an hour. If anyone would like to present, just let me know. You can message me and meet up. Oh, is my voice breaking up? Sorry about that. Let's see. Uh, that's perfect for me, I guess. Is it okay? Okay. Yeah. Well, with that, let's let's turn the time over to Neil and uh, for his presentation on cloud functions. And thanks again, Neil. Yeah. Just wanted to have a quick overview, like uh, how our audience is. Uh, has, has anyone familiar with GCP or working on cloud or are everyone new EHO? Just a quick overview, like how our audience is. Yeah, I'm very familiar with GCP and all the all the CSPs. Uh, I'm a I'm a solution engineer for a database company, so I kind of have to be interested in all that stuff Ooh, for our customers. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And okay, I'm mostly in AWS, but Lambda functions, so similar similar technology, different platform. Yeah, that's yeah. This is the same, but the another name and another cloud provider. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start our thing today. Hope is it visible? Is it visible? Yeah, it's visible. Yep. Looks good yeah. now. So let's start unlocking the power of serverless computing with cloud functions. And we will today see the use cases, why it is important, and how we can leverage the benefits of it. So yeah. This is Neil Shah, building DevOps communities over in my local region, running Google Cloud, CNCF, Docker, HashiCorp, all the communities over in my local region. That is Ahmedabad, Gujarat, and India. And maintained for more than 15 plus hackathons across India. And yeah, currently working as product manager at Internet InfoTech. And a pretty DevOps guy, learning and exploring everything in DevOps. So let's start what is serverless computing because eventually we will directly won't jump on cloud functions cloud functions is a serverless function eventually but we don't know what is serverless computing so let's see first what is serverless computing serverless computing is an execution model where the cloud providers automatically manage the infrastructure of our code so eventually we don't need to interrupt anything and in between we just need to deploy our function there and it will automatically add our function or application and it will automatically manage all the scalable things all the storage, everything will be managed there directly by the service provider. We don't do, need to uh, interrupt anywhere. And eventually, there will be a manual intervention after deploying, and it will take a developer's mind to properly focus on the core building of the code, core, core building of the product, core building of the project, not on other thing to managing the managing infra and all sort of thing. Eventually, it will take the burden up from the developers, from the DevOps people, and it will help them to focus on the main thing, apparently on different things, monitoring, security, password, but not on the infra part. It will help that. Next. Let's shift from traditional models. Why? Because why? what we are doing in traditional models? We were taking up this uh, VM, we were taking up the CPU, some, some CPU, some VM, and putting our application there. Then we need to monitor things because we don't know when our application got many hit, many requests. The storage goes up and the application crashes. So we always uh, try to set up the triggers and set up the monitors over there, set up alerts so we can figure out. And eventually, a manual thing would be there majorly. Because a large scale application don't directly rely over here. 
they need to monitor many things. They have many dashboards, big dashboards where thousands and thousands of alerts are there. And all the things will be manually done then. They need to trigger, they need to uh, scale up the volume, scale up the infrastructure. When some, let's let's take one example, on Black Fridays or on like any sale, the e-commerce application has many requests. So eventually to handle all those requests, they need a good server on that portion. Eventually on regular day, they don't have that many, that many requests and that many server, like, uh, server volume up. So eventually we are shifting from traditional models to serverless computing. Next, yeah. So what are the advantages? So it's cost effective. Why we say cost effective? It just take the money from the execution time. It doesn't take like uh, when your application is down. Down in the sense like uh, the minimal usage is done. So it doesn't take money. And it's also not taking the upfront cost eventually. When we go for a manual thing, it will take upfront cost. Next is at some time, our volume or our service or infrastructure boots up. So it will take money at that time. But eventually, on a lo lo local day or lo local region, it, it is in a medium re re medium state. So it won't charge any extra money from, from us or from any scalability. As I told, you need, don't need to see the infra or anything. It will automatically scale as per the request as per the hour request as per the request input request output we don't need to think about that it will automatically scale and give best performance of our application eventually in, in the worst situation also worst situation is let's say i have 100 users today and tomorrow i have one lakh users then because the, there is a best situation for company but but for our developer people for our developer people it's a very healthy we need to set up the infrastructure and all like properly. Otherwise, the application or website will be crash directly. So it's a scalable. And focus on code, not on infra. Eventually it will, uh, making the infra, it takes a lot of time, but you just need to deploy functions over here and it will, and also like for the first time, you it will take time to deploy all the things, to match all the things. But yeah, then, you don't need to care about us. So that are the main three advantages of serverless computing. And if anyone have any doubt in between, you can definitely ask. So it's an evolution how serverless has adapted and in the current world. So when previous time and the like like 80 uh, 18 days or nine sorry uh, 1980 something there were uh, physical machine. If you need to set up your infrastructure, you need to buy a React in your own premises and set up the whole infrastructure. So it was a time there. And eventually there were larger, larger rack where you need to set up your infrastructure. Then came virtualization. So on a single machine, you can use VMware or virtual box or sort of thing. And make us some make a partition of your main machine on the top of you can have like uh with using hypervisor you can have the different vms different virtual machines and you can utilize uh windows you're going to do everything on a single piece but yeah that's take a large large amount of storage and it it like it hardens your pc's life <laughs> then came cloud computing eventually all we are in the same arena of cloud computing, then came containers, and then eventually in almost in 18, like let's uh, let's say today the boom of generative AI, Gen AI is going on. So in 18, like 2018s, 2015s, the serverless computing was booming at that time. And eventually many people have adapted, started adapting the serverless computing, serverless functions, but yeah, some have not. So let's focus like if some are not like why you are not using because there are many benefits. So what are the benefits of that? So key concepts, event-driven execution. So event-driven execution is whenever we have a storage, if something is changed in our storage, something is the event has occurred, it will directly trigger that. And it will automatically work on 
what is there and like uh, what what from our function directly. Next is when we uh, provide HTTP request on the function, then it will trigger and it will work on the function. So there are different uh, scenarios. Or uh, let's take a simple example. Let's take a version control system like GitHub. If something is committed on GitHub, it will make a change. And eventually it will also make another change in the infrastructure of the production. So eventually it will directly change here. We don't need to react. So for, for the first time, we need to match the authentication of the GitHub or version control system stuff. It was, but eventually it will directly do that. Now, whatever we commit on them. Next is automatic scaling. Eventually I discussed about this. It scales directly an infinite distance or like infinite storage up to your request, up to your like request. Like if you like if you have currently eight GB of storage and eventually you need almost like thousand GB of storage, and it will directly scale. It will it won't be like you need you need like approval or sort of a thing. It will directly scale and also scale down directly when there is no not of use. And pay for execution. How much the execution uh, cost has been done. It will only like only take that much. It won't take. Uh, this was like a thousand GB of uh, storage was used, so you need to pay all uh, for all the time of thousand GB. No, it's not. Today you are is doing eight GB, and yesterday that was a peak time, and you are using thousand GB, and it will eventually pay around what what you are using, not on any other thing. So why serverless? It's cost effective, scalable, focus on the core, not on the infrastructure, and it's event driven. As I tell. So cloud functions. Cloud functions is one of the one of the services provided by GCP, that's Google Cloud Provider, Google Cloud Platform. And you can use this to build, like to deploy your functions, serverless functions automatically. To like to respond to various events which were triggering without the intervention of your manual thing. Eventually, this fun this sort of functions is provided by all the major cloud provider in AWS. It will be Lambda in Azure. It is Azure functions. So eventually, all have. But you need to understand basic functionality of what it is being doing, and eventually, you can also adapt. So it is the Cloud uh, like language agnostic. Language agnostic is not in general, but yeah, it supports Node.js, Python, Go, Java, .NET. So it covers the major thing, major languages. Let's have a quick. Uh, just a minute. I don't know the demo doesn't uh, wasn't okay. Mm. Uh, you can see the demo here. I see uh, uh, there's a video play, or something. Yeah, but it doesn't it's not playing. Oh no worries. Let's, let's uh, see. Yeah, and uh, after uh, like after like after this thing, and uh, let's go on. No worries. So yeah, what are the different use cases? Yeah. So what are the different use cases? How we can use this? So indicating either different web hooks with different third party APIs too, because. What happened is in an application, there are different like uh, function calling recursively. There are functions. If this event has occurred, then the next function should be called. Then the next function should be called. So eventually, there are many functions. So you can integrate with with third party web hooks. Uh, let's say one example. If you if, if something is committed on a version control system, then eventually a uh, email should uh, email should be sh shoot out to your product manager or someone. So this is a simple use case. So eventually you can do this. 
with by cloud function directly. You can trigger uh, the GitHub version of VCS with the cloud function and cloud function with this service, uh, the email model, email service of Google Cloud or any, any MailChimp or anything. And directly the mail will be triggered there. So similarly, uh, real-time data processing. So why, why, why we say real-time? Because eventually on real-time, we like we take feedbacks from you like on a like on a app where we are using a quizzing platform. So we are taking the answers from like uh, we are taking the preference of people like what's the best best thing? What do you love or love about our, our application? What is the best quiz you want to play? And eventually we are uh, after their response we are figuring out like, what is the best thing. So eventually, an answer also on the other part that real time data is necessary because sometimes we are monitoring the real time situations on this like, let's say a stock market or some like some some sort of thing, which is let's say cricket or any sports, which is going on in real time, and eventually all the gaming sort of thing uh, have their backend which are uh, real time data process all the major games. Software as applications are real time data process. And eventually, all the e commerce are real time data process. Why? Because whenever the order is placed, after the order place, there are major three, two or three different things. It will add a thing in inventory management. It will automatically send a confirmation mail. It will uh, track the order. It will also send a tracking link. So there are different things. So it, it can trigger after the real-time data processing. Next is video and image processing. So many times what happens is we, uh, we are uploading a photo or like any like a uh, photo on uh, some platform. And the platform constraint is you need to like just put a five MB or two MB of image. So many times the backend works directly here because eventually you are you as a company are storing their data in this much amount of memory. It would be a hectic thing when you are storing this many of amount of memory. Then it takes a lot of lot of amount of money. So what you can do directly if you got some photo from cloud service or like cloud storage, a new photo, then you can trigger a function where. The cloud, the, the photo size should be resized to 2 MB. Whatever may be the size of the photo, it doesn't mean it should be resized to 2 MB. And then, then just store at an hour uh, database of storage. So eventually it will help us out. Next is microservice architecture. If you have a, it, it's a currently and a trending motion, um, the difference or the fight or the fit between the monolithic architecture uh, versus microservice architecture. But yeah, microservice architecture, why it is preferred here? Because you can uh, split down the different function, the, the layer, different function application of, of, of the your application or product and split down them in different small, small functions and trigger them on real time. That will help you to scale down. Sorry, scale up. Eventually, we go don't go for scaling down. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a simple use case. So I hope you are seeing this. And whenever we push commits, as I already told, whenever we push something in our version control, so from GitHub Webhook directly, it will trigger the cloud function, and the cloud function will post the message on Slack. So that's a third party API, third party sort of integration. We are not using the API sort of thing, but yeah, eventually we are using that function and passing through all their API. So you can do this with any sort of third party services. And well, let's say here is GitLab or anything. And on this portion of the Slack, we have Discord or Telegram or anything. But you can do this anywhere. Next is uh, serverless mobile backends. So how it works is whenever uh, you have direct message from Firebase 
like some some uh, like some of the application users have message you that goes to Firebase, and Firebase has directly sent a message to you, then it will automatically trigger something if something is not worked. But yeah, eventually you need to set up the function in that manner. Also, the next thing is, uh, as I told, whenever we are uh, utilizing uh, the real time gaming sort of thing, real real time applications where user inputs are like uh, like user imp uh, inputs are making a uh, larger impact. At that time, this year, like uh, there will be direct notification from Firebase to the application, and similarly, the users. Uh, the users uh, uh, notion, users uh, like aspects will be triggered in the pub sub sort of thing. Pub sub triggers. What is pub sub? That is publisher subscriber. We will eventually go and pub sub and our demo. But yeah, that's a pub sub thing. So basically, in cloud functions, there are different types of triggers. So how trigger are? So it will. There are majorly three or four types. That is HTTPS. Whenever someone requests there. Uh, it will trigger. Next is whenever something is changed in our cloud storage, it will trigger. Next is pub sub service. This is pub sub messages sort of thing. So pub sub is publisher subscriber. So that is also pub sub service. And eventually through pub sub messages, what I eventually we are taking the direct messages from the application from the uh, infrastructure, and it will directly trigger there. Next is serverless IoT backends. So how? So we are, in recent scenario, what we have? We have automatic fans, automatic ceiling fans. So how eventually it triggers? You, you have a sensor along with the ceiling fan. So sensor takes a uh, temperature sort of thing. Temperature, like let's let's see here. Temperature is 80 Fahrenheit something. So it will take the sensor sensing and it will report to IoT code, any IoT service or cloud IoT code. Then through PubSub, because eventually it had directly taken, it is directly passing from the sensor. Through PubSub, the cloud function will work and the ceiling fan could be turned on or turn off. So eventually we are in the verge of like home automation, also. we are using everything in automation. We are in a place where we are very lazy. We are very lazy. To do all the thing manually, so eventually it is also helping out in this manner. Next is video image analysis. So eventually, I had told about the storage will be reduced and directly pushed there. But on another phase, when we are using uh, computer vision or something to directly monitor to directly monitor the objects. And to detect objects. So how it will do? So the cloud functions would help us to observe all the videos and to like cut down the metadata and eventually the, the, the thing which are feasible for us, which are matching the results, will be stored there. So eventually the cloud cloud functions can be set up anywhere in between as a interface or as a bridge where uh, two things can be uh, work together. The best practices are develop stateless functions, design stateless functions. So, why I have stateless function? Because eventually, what happens is stateless function like like uh, we don't need to depend on other database storage. We can depend on external storage, not on the on the using the uh, cloud function storage. It will eventually make. The function more flexible, more faster. Why? Because it is not depending on any main thing. It directly works like asynchronously. So it's a good thing to implement if we want to scale our application more faster and more efficient sort of thing. Yeah, and in dependencies. Eventually, we all have some libraries or so some say some dependencies. But yeah. We can use library dependencies and eventually we can also cache some of the dependencies for, uh, and uh, which are concurrent in our product or in our application. So eventually it will, what it will do is it will 
reduce the startup time, startup cold, cold startup time. What is cold startup? Like when our, our application is running properly, but after some time we are not utilizing it. So it will be on a bare, bare minimum storage because we are not utilizing. So eventually someday, uh, uh, some other thing came up and our application is on, on a large boom. So it will take a time to scale up. Not like, uh, longer, a lot, uh, lot of time, but yeah, eventually the auto scaling, but yeah, it will take some time. So to also to reduce that, because we are on a motive to properly if uh, make uh, the application more effective and the one uh, perform like most hundred percent. But yeah, eventually no, it's not hundred percent. But yeah, we are on a focus to do that. Next is setting up monitoring and logging. Eventually, why it is necessary? Because how the function is working. How many, uh, how much time it is taking, how much compute is taking. It is also like a thing which we need to observe. It's setting up a lot, like it's not for alerts, the storage would boost up or something. But yeah, it is uh, for us to understand how the function is working because eventually it will help us to understand that this, uh, the function, uh, one function is taking this much. So eventually for the second function, we will take some time after this and boost up the second function. So eventually for that sort of scenario, for that sort of microservice, different services, we need to understand from the monitoring perspective. So it is important to monitor also. Next is securing function code and dependencies. So you can do this with IAM or anything, but yeah. Also, from a like DevOps perspective, the security portion is also important because currently the DevSecOps field is also like in a boom. So to understand the security authentication authority mechanism and implement them and only only like give authority to some of the privileges to whom it is necessary. And also like currently check for the security perspective, like for, for from, uh, from the perspective of website or Penetration should be tested first and on a regular basis, security checks should be done because eventually what happened is, and when one of my colleagues for company, uh, one of the, uh, one of the, one of the employee leaked his, uh, AWS credential and some public and uh, public file. So in just uh, one day, uh, the bill was around 300 dollars. So that's the thing, what, what it can do. That was a smaller thing, but yeah, it can happen on a wide scale. And eventually the code can also export. So security also major concern. Optimizing a, a function execution time. So why you can also do this from monitoring. Why is it monitoring? Because the function takes some time and eventually we don't know how much time it is taking. But yeah, through logging and so through like we can observe, but in real time, how much time is taking? So eventually we will see the graph and also on that portion, we will see how we can optimize the function because it will also make a better thing. We have set 10 seconds for our execution time, but eventually it is taking only eight, eight seconds. So if we can reduce that, that sort of thing on a recurrent basis. So optimizing your cloud functions performance. That is, what are the best techniques we can do? These are the some things which I would suggest, but yeah, it will take some time. We, you need to first analyze for the cloud functions, then build some proper function, then apply the strategies. I won't tell like to be, uh, apply the strategies in the, in the front because it, it will take some time to understand the scenarios and which sort of scenario you are utilizing this. So what are cold starts? Cold starts is so because whenever like it take a warm up strategies. So what we will do is whenever our application is on a bare minimum storage or bare minimum and it's not a, like on a hold. So we will apply some functions to keep our function like to keep our like functions warm. So we will apply lightweight functions on every trigger. No, on, on, on every time interval, let's say on every day, you need to trigger this function. Triggering a function with time is also, uh, also applicable there. So 
definitely it will help us to improve our performance because what happened is we are on a bare minimum storage and eventually tomorrow we need to like have a boost up of our thousand gb so eventually it will take time so on that that sort of scenario what we can do is we can regularly up, like regularly apply a small lightweight functions so it will boost up our like application up and down up and down up and down uh, recurrently so it will also optimize our function it won't take a charge as a cost optimization person it won't take a much money from you but eventually it will help to uh, scale your function probably uh, we also discussed this minimizing execution time so break down the like major thing which is taking a larger time in smaller smaller functions and eventually it will take the similar amount of time but yeah you are uh, on a scale that you are satisfied that this many things have already happened. So try to do that. That's a similar way of microservice architecture, but yeah, also from the perspective of execution time. Fine tuning timeout value. So what are the timeout value? We had, uh, we, we cap some time. Eventually when our server, server, like the serverless function don't work, we have some uh, particular time. Let's say our function takes uh, 10 seconds version time. So we had put around 15 seconds of time of values. So if it doesn't work, then do some other function or trigger another function. That sort of thing is there. But eventually, you like from monitoring and you know, from all the perspective, you uh, came to know that your function in real time is taking almost 16 seconds. So then your time of value is correct? No. That's not correct. Right. So eventually also you need to set up the proper thing. And also, as I previously told, the security is a major thing that we need to implement in our project or in our application. So how we can do that? Using IAM, as everyone know, I am like those who don't know. IAM is a role as best thing where we can ensure the person who is utilizing our cloud or our services is how much permissions or how many read only, write only, execution only permissions should be given to him. So that's the thing from where you can manage all the things. I am next is securing function core and dependencies. So there are many credentials. So you can uh I you like so you can store them on third like some secure storage sort of thing. If you have your storage, then you can also, it won't be feasible to store your uh, store like credentials on version control system because there are challenges to leave. So try to have secure functions where you can secure uh, secure store your credentials somewhere, not from the, uh, not on the code bar. Handling sensitive data. Uh, yeah, you can also use Cloud Secret Manager for storing your secrets over there. Similarly, all the providers have their own secret management system. And apparently, there are many third-party tools currently and market for the uh, security thing. I have used Vault sort of thing. You know, if you heard about Vault, that is from Hashiko, which is a very popular tool for DevSecOps to secure store your credentials. It will automatically and uh, it can also connect with Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, all the clouds, eventually from single platform. So that, that sort of thing also can be implemented for the security pers pers perspective. Next is the thing which we discussed in the first slide. That was how we have evaluation, uh, how we are transformed from the physical machine to serverless computing. So all this, how which is scalable, which are operational, how microservice prevails. So in previous thing, in physical server, the microservice is very, very low. And in serverless, it's very high. And deployment speed, you can also see, you can compare all the things from this. So it's a good map where you can understand just how serverless computing is important in today's world. Although obviously, we are also utilizing containers, uh, you using Kubernetes and all, using Docker, Docker Spam, but eventually, server 
explain this also a thing which we need to understand and implement in our today's life. The next thing which I think is to be not from the perspective of service computing, but yeah, it's a thing where carbon awareness. I I also have a talk in Con Forty Two, DevOps FD edition on January twenty fifth, and it's our building DevOps software, building sustainable software. So eventually, if we say our website or server is is on cloud, so do we emit CO two? Do we emit CO two? We don't know. I will say I don't emit, but yeah, eventually the data centers emit a large amount of CO two. And eventually, the from the whole CO two which is emitted, the percentage of CO two emitted from the data centers is almost eight percentage. So eight percent is almost the, like a big amount of uh, CO two which is emitted from data centers. Eventually, in twenty two thousands, it was around three percentage, and it had apparently exponentially growth to around eight percentage. So it is a thing which every person, as a software engineer, as a developer, as a DevOps person, platform engineer, we need to keep in mind around carbon awareness from our like cloud or something. So these are the main three three things which I would suggest is uh, resize, move, and schedule. So resize is whenever your computing is not needed, you can directly scale down. So it will also there are two things. Things which will you will benefit that is reducing carbon and reducing your cost. As a company, we also have pin of engineer to reduce our cost. Next is move. So move is you have seen two, two different features where one is having rainy season and another is having a like warm season. That is that is sunny day. So eventually, it will be not be feasible for a big company. But yeah, as for a smaller company for smaller functions, they can move to the region where the CO two index. Is very low, so it will also emit a, lot, a small amount of CO two. And eventually, you can also schedule your uh, functions and how manner uh, you have done that. Uh, next is uh, it's a cloud captain organization or community where we have it's on open source and it's on GitHub. You can search this, and we have made a collection of all the resources for all the DevOps people, each and every. For all the providers, each and every text tool, and it's free for all. So if you want some resources over here in DevOps, you can always uh go for here and help it out. And yeah, you can connect with me for any queries. And uh, I will surely help it out on my my scale, like however I can help you. And thank you. And yeah, I will just have a last demo. Which was not working properly. Yeah, it's there. So we will see how the basic cloud function works. So you can directly start from cloud functions. And then you have two generations. The first generation was having a small function scale and the newer generation, which is currently going on, have a different like good amount of functions features which are implemented currently. You can give any name over here. Uh, we are giving them only. And yeah, there's a two generations. And yeah, I will pinpoint this. Uh, this is showing low CO two, low CO two. And also, Google is also supporting like sustainability because this uh, data centers over here in region these regions at that time were emitting low CO two. So it will tell to make your application and this, to make our functions in this region. Oh, yeah, like everyone is knowing regions. Yeah. So 
so yeah eventually google is also helping out to like promote that and yeah trigger so i as i already told about triggers so whenever http request is sent there it will trigger next is pubs that i told that's a public uh, publisher subscriber messages and uh, the next is cloud storage if something is changed on cloud storage it will trigger uh, if something is thrown from firebase it will trigger so yeah these are the major thing Eventually, there are many like advanced settings where you can select memory, you can utilize CPU, timeout, maximum number of instances on auto scaling, how many scale you want, on a build node, after post build, what you want to do, allow traffic. Traffic can also be handled over here as publicly available to everyone or not. And yeah, the next is you can go to next and you can, as I already told, it is because language agnostic because it is preferably for almost five languages. There is Node.js, you can see uh, .NET, Go, there's Java, Node.js, Python, PHP, Ruby. So here we are selected Python 3.11. And eventually for Python, there are two files. There is requirement and main dot main .py. So we will just go further with the demo and eventually you don't need to like write the code here. You can also zip up, upload file, uh, like zip, upload a zip there, upload a zip from your cloud storage. So eventually you can put any file over here. It's not compulsion to write the code here. And eventually then what we will do is we will test the function. On the first, on the first try, it will take some time. But yeah, eventually when you will see, see all the things are going on in the server directly. And you can also visualize what, what all the things are going on in parallel. And it's triggering events from HTTPS as we have mentioned. So eventually the function is building on and you can obviously see all the things which are going on in process parallelly. And then if on the first first time, it will take some time to install the dependencies if they have or to make a setup thing. You can see the function is ready to be tested. And if you are seeing, uh, it's printing hello nail, and we are changing uh, to like we have changed the uh, request over here, and we have changed to hello mark, and eventually it has directly told over here, and whenever we change the function, I will just show like how the function abruptly changes, and it 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 then it won't take a different amount of time as it, it takes to scale, uh, to make a function from the bare metal. So welcome all cloud people from different places, from Mark. See how fast it takes. And then what the next thing is, you just need to deploy and it will directly deploy on cloud run. So that was the thing. Thank you for like, the thing if you have any questions you can obviously ask to me and yeah that's from my thing my side thanks Neil. um that covered quite a bit uh, from the group does anyone have specific questions for neil i was going to ask what do you think you know th this is great to have a set of functions and a cloud service provider but what do you yeah. think you know about having uh, a space where this maybe doesn't fit. I mean, I think there's a number of applications where serverless and, and CSP functions, things like that, even if you are in GCP or something like that, I think there's still an area where serverless may not quite fit the bill. What do you, you know, do you have a response to a, a sort of a 
statement like that. Yeah. So yeah, serverless has a different scope and different particular use cases. Uh, one of the use cases which I, uh, I can definitely tell, like, and that use case is the best thing it is to be used is as I already told around the shipping thing. If the order is order is placed, then after the order is placed, there will be different three things, three or four things. That is, uh, it will directly uh make the entry in the inventory management. Next is it will automatically trigger a mail to the customer for the order successful. Uh, successful. And uh, next is it will also, uh, also track uh the order. So there are different things. So on this sort of scenario, and also uh on major thing is whenever there is real time video analysis or some sort of thing, then on that sort of thing it is important. And eventually all it it is giving you a bridge to connect different third party things between them. Let's say we I already discussed around GitHub and you, you can connect data with Slack. So at the intermediate, you can use this. Okay, okay. like uh, uh, answer your question. Yeah, I'm just thinking of, you know, the legacy applications, you know, when we think about application modernization, somebody's, uh, you know, already got an investment in, you know, maybe some DevOps, but there's a lot of other tools that they're using in their estate. And so bringing together maybe some native services and things like that, but not only, right? Because there's a whole other mm -hmm. breadth of knowledge, that kind of thing. It almost seems like serverless to a degree it is a tool like any other, you mm -hmm. got to use it, Yeah, you know, with some measure. Yeah. So majorly what I, what I will see, I, I will tell you, uh, if your product have a dozen uh, vast variety of uh, users, and that's sense, like, today you have 10 users and tomorrow you have 1,000 or 1 lakh users, uh, the, the scale is different. So if you, your, your, your user base or something is not there, then I won't tell uh, to switch, or switch to this because eventually it is necessary. Yeah, auto scaling is there in Kubernetes differently. Mm. Apparently. But yeah, eventually if you will ask any those people, so each and every company are using serverless functions, maybe on AWS, Lambda or something, or Azure functions. But eventually it is there. And after it can also connect ECS, that is container, system, container services, EKS with this. And eventually it will also boost up here, boost the thing. So okay. now I had kind of a follow-up question with that. Um, so like I've done some serverless and being kind of a traditional developer, I miss some of the, the typical tools you'd run on your workstation and do your development local, and then you do a build. And that was one of the beauties, I think, of containers and Kubernetes and, and some of those solutions where you run, you run locally, then your build process, um, the DevOps team, the containers puts them in like Kubernetes or ECS or, or another container orchestration tool. And it, it, it's pretty um, similar to what, what traditionally developers have been used to. When I did serverless, I found it, found it difficult to do local development and I had to always do it in the cloud. So I had to be connected. So kind of setting yeah. up those different environments was a challenge. Um, are, there, are there frameworks that help um, resolve some of those issues that some of the other like uh, like a Java environment might have Maven or a uh, JavaScript or TypeScript would have like um, yeah. Node so and NPM. If... Is there something similar like that for serverless? No, no, no. No, the serverless doesn't have any sort of framework, but eventually uh, you can use another thing sort of thing where you can use Putty or something to directly connect uh, your the server in a local system and you can do all those things locally and then directly connect with them. Because eventually okay. it doesn't have any framework, apparently, the serverless thing. But yeah, there are different tools where you can use and do the things locally. And also what you can do is you can attach directly your GitHub or version control system there and do the things, push there, so it will like be bigger there. So you don't need to like directly uh, work on that. Okay. Is there like a, I know there was the serverless framework at one time that still supported which had kind of DevOps type of features where you could run a deployment and it would push it to the cloud and then you could do your testing. Yeah. 
is that similar with cloud functions in Google? Yeah. Similarly, all the major providers do have eventually, but yeah, their name is just different. And AWS is Lambda, Google has Cloud Function, yeah. Azure has yeah. Azure Functions. All the uh, working on backend is the same, logic is the same. Do you see just one more question? So, like in a microservice application, like you had talked about, do you see a limit with serverless if, if you had a really large microservice application with hundreds or thousands of functions, does it get to be unwieldy in a serverless environment or does that not really matter? Yeah, eventually, but let's say you have thousands of functions, but you need to decide the whichever function is a major importance. So you can deploy because you won't be deploying thousands of functions on uh, cloud functions and we'll see how other functions are triggering, triggering. But eventually you will deploy one or like, uh, let's say 10 functions which are really important to be scaled so you will you will just deploy them only because apparently uh, if you will deploy thousand functions then your cloud your cost will be also multiplied because yeah. serverless functions are like almost uh like, like it costs some large a little bit of more, more more amount of money than the serverless so yeah so you need to understand like whichever function is important for your company or for your application. So you just need to deploy it. And it will help you to improve the application definitely. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah it sound, uh, thanks for the presentation. It sounds that it's very useful, obviously, but I feel that there is a need for a framework to allow deployment that has to be on a private cloud to also um, be capable of doing a serverless uh, model. And I hope yeah. sometime so serverless, I will come up. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. because obviously the service provider have invested and did something to make it easy for deploying on their platforms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So eventually for deploying things serverless uh we had made it the cloud function so and eventually they also have a service which like let's say we will deploy so where will you deploy it's a, on serverless deployment on cloud run for google eventually they have for deployment but for yeah we can like we will see the if there is a serverless framework where we, we can eventually do work on local and if anyone found then we will i will share uh the link with brad so eventually we can also help because there would be some things people are always have some thinking, but eventually we haven't worked there. So we will find out and help each and everyone on that more portion. Thanks. Are there other questions in the group? No, this is good. Thank you very much, Neil. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Thank thanks for getting up early for us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate thank you. that. Nice thank I you. will. Uh, I'll post this and put this once once it's available. I'll post it on the Meetup page and appreciate everyone's feedback. And if there's other presentations people would like to see, just uh, contact you know one of the organizers of the of our Meetup group, and uh, we have some more coming. We're planning again. In February, we won't do one in March because we have our conference, um, but we will do them uh, following that. So each month. So yeah. thanks everyone. Nice meeting y'all. Thank you, Neil. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks, once Neil. a second, like if everyone is like feasible, you can have a like quick um, like image of, like this. If everyone is feasible, it will be a memory for everyone. Yeah, Austin is yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's wait for two minutes. I have some everyone is like just a minute. What are we supposed to do, Neil? Have Rex also join Matthew. Yeah, we are just I've doing got, this. <laughs> I just got in gallery mode. Yeah. Anything, anything oh, okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Maybe I'll give you a two for one special. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
There you that's, go. That's uh, anyone take, can take picture. Uh, I'll try to do this. Screenshot, screenshot. Yeah. Right. Screen. Thanks, thanks hey. a lot. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, Neil. Neil. Bye. Thank you. Y'all stay care. warm out there. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>